Finally, it has come time to pick carrots. You see all these flowers? These are carrot flowers. So the flower, and then once it finishes blooming, it will close up, kind of like that. Focus. And then it will get to be more like this. And can you see the tiny seeds like that one right there? Those are the seeds that we save to grow new carrots next year. So we have lots of flowers in here. Lots, lots of seeds coming. All right, but we don't eat these carrots because they're two years old. It's a biannual, which means it takes dos, mes, uh, dos años, two years, before it creates seed. Um, that also means that the carrots are hella old that are in here, so I'm only letting them grow for seed, and that's why there's only a few of them in here. I know there's a lot of flowers, but uh, I also have zucchini and stuff like that in this bed. So now we're going to go past the Swiss chard bed with a bunch of beets still in here for us to pick. My onions, which are also going to seed. That's a different story. But this bed, see all the beautiful carrots in here? I do have some um, tomatillos in here that just, uh, they're volunteers from previous years. A couple beets, sunflower. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and get to picking some carrots. And even though I have never done it before, I'm going to can carrots. I am going to can up some carrots. What do you think of that? Can some carrots. All right. So what I do is I pick the carrot and I bring it over here and I put it in this bucket that is partially filled with water in there and I'll line them all up and that way they can still kind of sip and drink while we pick. So anyway, I'm going to get to it and then we're going to go inside and wash and peel. At first I didn't think I was going to have nearly enough carrots, but now I'm thinking I have a lot more carrots than I thought I did. So this bed is 10 feet long, same length as this bed, right? Uh, and about two and a half, three feet wide, two and a half, thirty 30 inches. And I picked carrots from here to here. So, two, four, two, two feet. And I have almost all this, I don't know how much it weighs, but um, yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see how many carrots we have. They're pretty big sized carrots though. Usually I can't grow a carrot to save my life. So this is the year I decided to finally grow them um, somewhere in my yard that has friable soil, you know, nice loose soil. And of course that's in a raised bed. So this was a good idea that worked. And uh, I, wow, let's just see how many carrots we get. Alrighty, so we picked that whole area and we got uh, two full five gallon buckets and one partially filled bucket and of course this includes you know all the toppings so I'm going to start pulling out carrots cutting off the uh, greens back to about that far and then um, I think I'll trim them up and peel them and then put them back into water um, we'll see how far I get I might then chop them all up tonight, um, and then I'd remove all the tops. But if I'm going to leave these another night, I want to leave some of the tops on to keep them fresher longer. So we'll just see how far I get. All right, so we're at the station, the preparation station. As usual, I've got all my accoutrements here. So what I've got are my carrots. So I wash, wash, wash. Scrub, 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 and then I peel, 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 and then I put them in this very cold water to wait until I'm ready to prep them. Again, I've got a little bit of top on there just in case I need to uh, leave these like in the fridge or something overnight. And, and if I did that, I would either leave them just in a little bit of water, like um, pretending like this is a big vase 
with flowers in it or um, I would wrap them in some wet toweling. I wouldn't leave them soaking in water like that. So we'll see how far I get. It's 95 degrees out, so you know, it's just kind of hot out here. But uh, it's a beautiful place to work. It's my favorite place in the world to process my fruit and veg. It's right out here on my little deck. All right, back to work. All right, so we got everybody all trimmed up here. And uh, these sat out overnight. And I uh, just put a damp cloth over the top of them, and they did really well. It got down to be about, uh, I don't know, 65, 70 degrees in here, and it did really well. The ones that still had the tops that were unpeeled actually got a little wonkier. Um, I had left these out, outside in some water. It's it, interesting just to see it. The peeled ones indoors, which stayed warmer all night long but had a damp cloth over it, did better than the unpeeled ones that were outside. Interesting. Um, so anyway, now it's time to get to the final step. So I will snap or uh, cut off the top of this on a cutting board. Obviously, it's pretty easy to do. I'll take a little bit of extra off like that. Um, and then I'm going to put them through the food process, which is this Cuisinart here. I've got the slicing blade on here, which is sharp as bejeebas is. Don't put your finger in there. And um, I'm going to have all these sliced for me. It'll make super quick work. Um, when I take the hopper out, the blade stops spinning. Lots of safety features in this. I love this food processor. Um, buy good equipment. It will last you uh, quite a long time. This is a Cuisinart 14 cup. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Whenever I need any tool, I go to American Test Kitchen, uh, which is a, uh, it's got, they have a YouTube channel. They do um, cookbooks and a whole bunch of stuff. And I see what they have rated as the best. That's where I got this peeler. Um, I, every kitchen tool I have pretty much I've gotten from their advice. I used to research it all myself. They do all the research for me. Um, so they recommended this. I recommended my peeler, a whole bunch of stuff, and this is great. All right, so my tools. I've got my tools ready in case I miss some spots. We'll slice them up, and then we'll get them ready to can. I know this is kind of a pain in the butt lining them all up like this because the the blade is flat in there when it goes around it's much easier just to kind of have everything standing up as opposed to you know you just throw it in there and it'll fall at some kind of angle so we'll go ahead and uh, get that rocking and rolling. Well, just an extra thought, you know, I'm cutting off those ends that are just too small to go into the canning process or too weird. So uh, I'm going to save these and I'm going to make some um, split pea soup tonight. So save them. Don't throw them away. All right, so of course we're going to pressure can these. Uh, I have my ball book out and I have my uh, the USDA complete canning guide out to. What I wanted to show you in these is uh, the recipes are almost identical, so that's not a problem. Uh, the amounts, though, it's always so helpful to me. So on the National um, Center for Home Food Preservation, an average of 17 and a half pounds without tops is needed per load of seven quarts. I'm doing pints, though. Average 11 pounds is needed per canner of nine pints. A bushel, uh, 17 to 25 quarts, is about two and a half pounds per quart. So that's pretty helpful. Um, if you select small baby carrots, you don't even need to cut these up. In the ball book, uh, it gets a little different amount. So use small carrots. Larger carrots might be fibrous. You need it two to three pounds, so 900 grams to 1.37 kilograms of carrots for each quart or one liter jar. So uh, just some amounts for you. You need a lot of carrots to can carrots. I'm hoping um, that I've got 11 pounds so I can do nine pints and I've got my pint jars going in the dishwasher. So let's uh, finish up slicing them up, then I'll weigh them and then we'll do math. Got them all chopped up 
Great size, weighed them out, and just shy of 11 pounds. So hopefully we get nine pints. So now the canning process shall begin. All right, so here we are. Carrots sliced. I'm gonna do the raw pack, uh, so not hot pack, I'm doing the raw pack. So fill hot jars tightly with raw carrots, leaving one inch headspace. The ball book said one generous inch, inch of headspace, so I'm gonna do that. Add one teaspoon of salt if you like. I usually don't salt my food uh, till I'm cooking it, so I'm not gonna salt it. Um, add the hot cooking liquid, so if you'd hot packed, you'd use that liquid or water, and I've got some water on the boil. One inch headspace, remove air bubbles, yada, 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 and take them out to the canner. Now it's gonna be 100 today, so while I'm doing the hot water and the lids in here, I'm going to can outside. Right, so I leave my dishes in the dishwasher. They're nice and hot in there right now, so every time I pull some out, I'll close that. Um, I'm gonna come over here. I'm at my jars, not all the dishes. So these are nice and hot. Um, they won't stay hot for very long though, especially because I'm gonna be putting cold carrots in here. So uh, yeah, let me get started. All right, so we'll do a couple jars together. Um, just try to get in as many as we can. Uh, carrots, I mean. Really get all those suckers in there. It says to tightly pack. Actually, just come over here and tightly pack over this. The jars, because they've just come out of that dishwasher, they're not um, incredibly hot. And of course, these are not hot. So, you know, usually when you're canning, you're rushing around like crazy, trying to keep everything nice and hot. But this is more, um, a little less hot. So an inch of headspace, I could measure it, but really an inch is at the bottom of these um, things that you screw on, what it threads. So this neck right here, this neck thread, that's an inch. So just stay right underneath that. Is that a generous inch? So I'm gonna give that a generous inch. I'm gonna do it again. Now, you guys can totally salt uh, your food if you want to. Keep in mind when you're canning, Often it'll say use canning salt or um, anything but regular table salt. Well, not anything, but most anything. The reason behind that is is that uh, table salt is iodized and it can cause uh, your water, your fluid, your brine to get cloudy. The iodine reacts uh, in there and causes cloudiness. So uh, that's it. I mean, it doesn't hurt anything. It just makes it cloudy and some people find that um, unacceptable. We don't care here, but I also use kosher salt or sea salt. So good enough for me. Now let's add some water. All right, so I'm just gonna take this hot boiling, almost boiling water from here to here. Could use a ladle or something. Get up there for a good inch. Uh, do this one. I mean, look, it, canning is not complicated, right? If I can do it, anybody can do it. And I mean that honestly. So now we're supposed to debubble, get all those bubbles out of there. So I'm going to use this chopstick. It's hard to get in there, though, with all the, the carrots. Mr. Old School Preppers sneaking in the back. Got a dog jumping around. All right, so that's kind of working. <laughs> Any uh, tips and tricks on doing debubbling with such a large amount of stuff would be helpful. All right, so I got that. Push it back down. Jeez. I'm going to have to remove some of those. All right, now lids. Ring. I know we don't need to heat up our lids and rings anymore. I still do it. I just believe that it helps a little bit, but we don't need to according to the rules. All right, wipe down. Got that. Got that. Oh, that doesn't, oh there we go. Top on, top on, and then I'll take them 
outside to the canner. And don't reef on these, right? You just want them fingertip tight, which is uh, to where you can't move forward easily, easily forward. And uh, yeah, so we'll take these out to the canner and do this eight more times. All right, you guys, so we're out here at the canner. I've got eight biggins in the bottom or wide mouth. And I'm going to get eight more stacked on top. And so we'll have 18 in here. I reread the recipe and of course it says uh, 11 pounds is supposed to make nine pints. <laughs> My little just shy of 11 pounds has made more than 20 and there's still room. I mean, I still have a whole bunch of carrots. So what I did is uh, I weighed them, and that's where my problem is. I am only getting about uh, eight and a half, nine ounces of carrots into each one of these instead of a pound. And I'm sure that's because I have larger carrots um, probably than you're supposed to can. But uh, that's the way I grew them, and they're still nice and tender, so I don't think they'll be too fibrous, but that explains the difference. All right, so I've got the wide mouth in the bottom. I'm doing a double stack on my Presto 23 canner here. I um, have had this on low for a while, so I'm going to now put my lid on, and I've done my checks. I know that this is clear. This is on tightly. Um, my seal is good and my uh, vents are all working. What I did is I marked this area because it's hard to see with a red V and then I match it up over here to that red V so I know how to easily put this on and off. Of course it's hot as Hades out here but we'll go ahead matchy matchy and then I need two hands for this part. Get it closed. And now I'm going to slowly bring up the temperature. Um, one reason I like this Camp Chef is because I know after this gets boiling and I get it up to 11 pounds of pressure um, that I can put it down to low and it will stay there. I've used this enough where I know that that is the case. I've got my aftermarket weight, and this is 15 pounds the way it is, and I'm gonna take off uh, one of these to make it 10 pounds. And um, again, this is the aftermarket weight. If you have the original that came with the Presto, it's a 15 pound weight. You cannot manipulate it, so it will always be 15 pounds. Uh, therefore, you're not gonna get that jiggle or waggle at five or ten pounds only if you're about 16 pounds of pressure. They don't uh, mention that very often so if you're wondering why your weight isn't rocking it's because it's actually a weight it's not a jiggler and um, I, I wish they would just be more clear about that but you can buy these aftermarket ones for I don't know 10 15 bucks on Amazon. Take off one ring, it's 10 pounds now. Take off two and it would be five. So now we'll just wait for this to come to temperature uh, or uh, start venting, excuse me, for 10 full minutes and then we'll put the weight on and bring it up to temperature. All right, can you see that steam coming out right there out of the uh, vent? So that's where we want to begin timing for 10 minutes. Once 10 minutes is done, then um, it, all the oxygen will be out from the inside. You'll see the secondary vent bubble, hiss, water gets out of there, and then it pops up. No worries, it's supposed to do that, so don't freak out. Um, that's one way that if it's too hot, it can de-pressurize, uh, but also that black button over there will pop out if something bad happens. So don't worry about it. Just let it be, but 10 minutes, and that's supposed to be up. Not all canners have that, though, so make sure if you're following that rule, it's a Presto canner or a canner that has a, all right? Okay, we'll come back when 10 minutes are up. All right, so we're going for 10 minutes now, and it's time for me to put the weight on. Um, 
I'm probably a little overkill with this. I'm always worried that the steam is going to get me. So you put that vent in to here. And what I'm going to do, of course, is way overboard. But, you know, who wants to get burned? So put that on. And now, um, because where I am is about 100 feet above sea level, I'm going to watch the gauge to get up to 11 pounds, and then my rocker will start rocking. Now remember, this is an aftermarket 10-pound gauge I've got there. Um, so you watch for 11 pounds, and people say, well, why do you use a 10-pound gauge if you really need it to be 11 pounds? In the recipe books, too, they even say the same, 11 pounds, 10 pounds. The reason why is because the weight will be heavy enough not to move up to 10 pounds, but when you get into 11 pounds, that's when the weight starts moving. Or if it was a 15-pound weight when you get to 16 pounds, or a 5-pound weight when you get to 6 pounds. So they really want you to be at the 1 pound higher, um, but because the weights don't rock until one pound passed, um, they say use another 10 pound weight. And then when it starts rocking, then you start timing, right? So anyway, that's a quick explanation for that. I'll use the gauge and the weight. I like to use them in tandem. Um, once this comes up to temperature, I'll listen to see how this is moving and the sounds it's making. And that way I can sit out here and do some other work, always with my um, canner within eye distance so I can see it, but um, I can listen for it as well. So we'll come back when it starts rocking. All right, so I'm at just over 11 pounds. Hopefully you can see that. See my rockers are rocking. Uh, so I'm going to start timing now. 25 minutes, four pints. So here we go. So can you see what I mean about listening for that? Now I can walk around and just listen for that sound instead of having my eyes on this the whole time. All right, so coming back now, and we're going to go ahead and take this off because we're down to zero. No steam, but I'm still going to take this off and let this be for about 10 more minutes before I take the lid off. Um, just another precaution that I take. All right, so it's been 25 minutes. I'm going to go ahead and turn this off. And we're just going to leave it here until the dial gets to zero. That's around the time where I'll, I'll pull the uh, jiggler or the weight off. You don't want to quick cool these. If you do, like, pull the weight off right now, um, all your jars in there are going to lose their seals and the uh, some of them will break. So just don't do that. It's just not worth it. Sometimes I remember my mom taking this and putting it in the sink and running cold water on it. Oh my God, it just makes my feet curl. You don't want to warp your canner. You don't want anything bad to happen. So just be patient. Wait till the dial gets to zero and then wait even 15 or 20 more minutes or pull up the uh, weight to see when it goes, uh, when the steam stops coming out. So we'll test that together. But right now we're just going to leave it sit and go down to zero. Sucker's hot. All right, lift it up backwards like that. So if those that water comes off, it doesn't get you. Put this someplace safe. Oh, it smells so good. It smells like carrots, shockingly. Uh, and then I'm gonna move them from there to the table here. We might hear some popping as we go. We may not, I don't know. Let's go this way, what do you think? All right, and these go like this way. This is the end that grips. This is the end you hold. This gripper is older than almost everybody watching this show. Air is still evacuating. The container looks like it's boiling, isn't it? And part of it's boiling, but part of it is still that the air is leaving. It's amazing. I'll just take all these out, and it's uh, well over 100 degrees outside, so 
I don't have to put a towel or anything like that down. I'll take them all out. All right, so we got everybody out and uh, everybody sealed, which is awesome. Just doing a quick little light touch, not too heavy. I don't want to push a lid down if it um, hasn't sealed, but they've all sealed. You can still see that the pressure is high. Lots of good vacuuming going on in here, which is why these are still uh, bubbling away, boiling. Less, uh, more pressure in here, more vacuum in there brings the uh, boiling point of water to a higher or lower temperature inside the vessel. It's all very interesting. So anyway, there we go. Um, one thing I do notice a lot is that the rings get pretty loose when I first pull them out of the canner. So I do give them just a slight, slight twist just to keep them on there. But yep, uh, success. I'm going to have to make sure I clean these jars though. They got a little something on them. Salt water probably. All right. Thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions. All right, you guys. So now it's the next morning after canning up the carrots. And what you want to do is bring your carrots over to your sink or wherever you're going to wash the jars. And this is an important step. Usually when people do canning videos, they stop after everything's out of the canner. And I'm guilty of that too. And I don't show you the final steps, but they're so important. Uh, so the next morning, Make sure everybody's all sealed. Take off the ring, and then you're going to wash the jar. Wash, 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 wash. Rinse, 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 rinse. And while you're washing and rinsing, you're going to make sure that the jar is sealed. You can just pick up the jar off the ground. This is a great way to do it. Just by the lid, make it, make sure it's sealed. Um, and, you know, tap it. Make sure it's concave, not convex. Um, and just take a look at everything, make sure there's liquid in at least half the jar, no cracks. You know, it's just a good time to touch your jars and look at everything. Look how old that lid is. It's even got the gray rubber. <laughs> Who knows? All right, and then we're going to let them dry. And um, then we're going to write on the top of the lids. If you wanted to, you could print out some labels and scotch tape them on, which is what Mr. OSP and I did last time we made sauce. And or um, you can buy pre-cut stickers and then just print them off your printer. I just got the stickers off Amazon. They're just office stickers. And this is some Marionberry jam we made from our Marionberry uh, bushes, the berries in July of 2019. It's all beautiful. Uh, so you can do that, or, um, you know, we went through a stage of trying to keep everything so professional, but now, carrots, and it's 9, 20, 24, that's good enough for me, um, and then we put them on the shelf. Now, why do you want to wash your jars, especially if you did some canning like I did? I mean, it's carrots and carrot water, right? What could possibly go wrong? Well... Carrots have a lot of sugar in them, and um, it can start fermenting on the outside of the jars, get sticky, and call to the uh, bugs and the animals. Uh, I learned this lesson the hard way. I, I can meat, and when I lived in my last house, Mr. Old School and I, and two of my friends, because I was teaching them to can, canned about 300 pounds of tuna. We drove to the coast, we bought tuna, um, albacore tuna, line caught fresh off the boat. It was great. It was like $1.99 a pound for albacore. So we bought it, canned it up, and at that point I was pretty new to the game of uh, pressure canning, and I had never canned uh, meat on my own before. So I, we did that and then um, put it into the cupboards, and everything looked great. The jars were pretty clean, surprisingly. And then a month later, the smell started. It took me a while to figure out that the smell was emanating from the cupboard that I had put the tuna, oh my God, rotting tuna fish. It was just on the outside of the jars. It was just that film that was on the outside of the jars. We had to throw the cupboard away. We had to throw the cupboard away. We took all the jars out. We had to wash them, I don't know even how many times. It was horrible, horrible, horrible. I wouldn't have people over to my house for days.
So anyway, you get the the info there. So wash your jars. And like I said, again, it's also just a good time to, to check the seals. So, all right, let me know if you have any questions. Now these are ready to go into the cupboard. They're shelf stable or onto the shelf. Shelf stable and how long will they last? The new jars come with a warning that says that they last 18 months. Um, the USDA, FDA, and most people that I know that are canners will say as long as the jar is sealed, it's good to go. If you ever have a fear about that, you can just heat up your food to uh, bo the point of boiling for about 10 minutes, and if there happens to be any bugs in there, it'll kill it. But of course, uh, you always want to listen to the whoosh and make sure that seal is there. Um, you're going to want to smell it and then give the food a little taste. Um, but as long as it smells good, you can give it a little taste after you've heated it up. But there are some foods, you know, like jam, you're not going to want to heat that up. So you really just want to make sure you hear that whoosh. I like literally put it next to my ear and I listen even for the quality of the whoosh. If it's not really there, I just chuck it even if it's only kind of there. I don't, I, you know what? The uh, 15 cents that this cost me isn't worth anybody's life. Botulism is odorless and tasteless. It's, and sightless, you can't see it. So, All right, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks for watching, talk to you later.